Hi, welcome to another episode of the Visual Storytelling Today podcast. The show is designed for you, the marketer or entrepreneur, who may be looking for more effective ways to connect better with audiences through the exciting world of visual storytelling. We will introduce you to inspiring experts from diverse industries that bring fresh perspectives on how to capture attention, build trust, emotional empathy, and last but not least, drive business results. Enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Shlomi Ron, uh, the CEO at the Visual Storytelling Institute, uh, based here in uh, sunny Miami, Florida. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Visual Storytelling Today show. Uh, as you know, I often talk with my clients and I typically said that uh, the reason we visual storytelling, brand storytelling is so important these days is because the dragon in this story is really what is known as the growing communication noise. Lots of marketers are talking about the main challenge to connect with audiences these days. And visual storytelling, it's really what I think the ultimate uh, Trojan horse to break through the clutter. So when you look at the landscape of communication and you see paid media really struggling with ad fraud, ad blocking and less than perfect context, uh, when your brand story that you invested so much uh, is really uh, slated next to competitors pre-roll ad or even get uh, <laughs> other distractions, you see that there's great need for a, a new way to uh, place brand storytelling in a more effective way. And this is really our topic for today. We're gonna to talk about how brands can tell long form visual stories more effectively. And for this uh, great uh, topic, I invited the uh, great, uh, great friends I just came uh, across on LinkedIn. <laughs> And this is Nina Jacobson and uh, Hela uh, Jabiri. And they are the co-founder of Bytes. It's a brand film platform headquartered in Copenhagen, Denmark. And Nina and Hela are looking to revolutionize branded uh, long, long form films and give them a center stage that they truly deserve. In this sense, uh, you might want to think about uh, Bytes as really a version of Netflix, but for branded visual stories, uh, offering high quality visual storytelling without any ad interruption and any, uh, and really in a optimal cinematic experience. So with that, uh, welcome to the show, uh, Nina and Heli. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, so before we get started deeper into uh, what uh, you guys are doing and revolutionizing, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and uh, if you can, you know, what was that magic moment that made you start Bytes? So maybe Nina, do you want to start? Yes, I'd love to. And thank you for having us. Um, well, I've been working with business development and communications my entire career. And um, lately I've both been working for brands, but also for some production companies doing uh, long form branded content. And um, on both sides, both for the brands and for the production and content creators, uh, there was this uh, um, need for a platform that could honor these long-form film in a better way than the platforms they had at hand. Uh -huh. So basically they were they were sick and tired of creating beautiful long-form films that were then either cut into short-form pieces to suit social media or just not seen uh, uh -huh. for the first 10 or 15 seconds. So my magic moment was basically speaking to brands and marketers who had this pain of where do we put long-form brand documentary? Mm. Meet me. Yes, me too. That was a <laughs> magic moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mutual magic yeah. moment, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How about you, Hope? I, I, I come from the other side of the table because I used to work with um, commercial broadcast and radio, actually, for many years, also doing business development, but with a, a little bit another focus, mainly on how can we, how can we get more money, how can we get our revenues to grow when the commercial blocks are full? So mm -hmm. what do we do? We then started building these 360 degrees partnerships. So trying to find out how can we be a better partner for all the brands that really want to stand out in, in the, I mean, on, on, the, on the screen, especially on TV. Um, and we had so many good ideas and we had so many nice brands who really wanted to do programming. Uh -huh. But the legislation was so hard on us every time we had good ideas. So it always ended up with not being possible to really fulfill whatever the brand needs. So I thought when I met Nina and we talked about this, well, we were so 
we, we did so agree that there was a need for a new marketplace, a marketplace where brand could really fold out their eagerness of building their own programs and also where they could really get this engagement with the audiences that they're yeah. really seeking competition and media, but they were just not allowed to um, yeah, basically do what they want. Yeah, I remember at some point uh, this type of uh, content used to be called uh, sponsored content or uh, advertorial, advertainment. Uh, yeah. Did you come across all these labels, I, native advertising? <laughs> And that was basically what we could offer them. It's like, especially where I was working, we could offer them one minute time slots, mm -hmm. but it was a little bit uh, short, basically to tell a story. You had like 40 seconds to tell the story, to fold up your editorial skills. Right. And then you had 10 seconds to present it in a sponsor credit and 10 seconds after to present oh, this program was sponsored by, but you basically had 40 seconds of telling that story, which was, never the I would say best result yeah no definitely before the show I did some uh, research on your website and I found something I really liked uh, when you said too many good stories from brands are distributed uh, as traditional ads and therefore drown out in digital noise so I'm kind of wondering uh, how bytes uh, really help overcome this problem yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was basically take the best from the platforms that we knew and, and build something that honored these long form films and put them center, center stage. So when you go to Bind, you go there to watch the branded content because you love it and you like what you mm -hmm. find. Um, I mean, what we often hear from marketers and, and brands uh, is that um, it's difficult for them to get through to the consumer because the platforms available to them weren't designed for long form storytelling. Yep. And there's a lot of either exit links or noise on these platforms in different ways, or you have more of sort of a scroll down uh, behavior as a consumer rather than lean back and enjoy an hour long uh, documentary from Jaggery, for example, as we have on, uh, on our platform. So we wanted to create a place that was kind of serene and quiet and where you could sit down and enjoy and really just let the brand and the consumer connect on their own. And we had this thesis that if we did that, we could uh, convince people to spend a lot more time uh, listening to brands and watching brand stories. And actually the brand would become more an expert within whatever they were doing, uh, creating wine or creating more like. I see. Um, because we did studies in, in different focus groups, we actually heard statements like, we really want to engage with branded content. Mm -hmm. Because who is to know better about beers than Carlsberg? Right. So they were really like experting the brands uh, whenever the story was good. They really, it really gave the story, uh, I would say, an extra level of trustworthiness um, because it was produced by a brand who was to be an expert within the topic. So basically, in essence, what you're saying is that brands are actually uh, wear the hat of educators because they're experts yeah. in this space. And that's how the credibility is higher when they tell these stories. Yeah, and I think there's a reason why on, on traditional TV formats like sort of behind the scenes or airport TV or, you know, formats where you go behind and see how you're actually creating things or how is the workplace actually functioning. I think there's a reason why they've been so popular for many years. Mm -hmm. People like to go behind the scenes and see, you know, how do you create what you create? Who are your experts? And, and we know all brands have, uh, all companies have experts that are, you know, if you sit down and talk to them, you'll just be mesmerized by whatever content they're talking about because they're really good expert, experts on what they're doing. Uh, Actually, now that you are describing it this way, it's kind of made me realize because I, I think, Helen, your, your background, you, you work for Discovery Channel, right, in Denmark? So this yeah, is really Discovery Channel for branded content because you kind of dig deeper. It's kind of more science, uh, you know, getting the backstory of how things are actually working, right? <laughs> yeah, you didn't really come close to get to know the brands from a different angle yeah. and to get to know the good stories that they, I mean, that they should be sharing, but that mm -hmm. is so difficult to put into a 30 second format because you basically have another, um, you have another mission with the 30 second piece of app, you want to sell products. So we have the one bites you tell, you don't sell. But, but the mix of telling and selling is so, so important, uh, especially in the, the media 
market that we see today. If you want to break the clutter, if you want to create engagement and brand ambassadors, you should definitely tell your story and after sell your product. Right. Yeah, so that brings, brings me to the next question is, what is the business model of Bytes? What are the services you offer in brands? When we go out to um, brands and agencies, basically, uh, CMOs can be our clients and, and media agencies and also digital agencies. Uh -huh. And we offer them guaranteed plays to their content. Mm -hmm. So if they have a 25 minutes long documentary on whatever topics that they choose to do, let's take Jaguar as an example, which is uh, which is a live piece on, on the platform at the moment. Yep. It's a 50 seven minutes long documentary on how Jaguar built the first, oh, wow. uh, yeah, their first, um, how do you say, um, electronic, car. electronic car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it was very, very difficult for them to get this distributed because not many places could house a 57 minute long documentary and give right. them, I would say, guarantees of, uh, of views. So, so this is a nice uh, way of where we can approach the brand and say, well, we can guarantee you X views to this content uh -huh. of X quality. Got it. So we kind of higher the level of what you can buy in the digital market mm -hmm. to say on bytes, you both buy guaranteed views to your content and you also buy guaranteed views of a certain quality. So either we give you the, um, the guarantee of 30, 60, or 90 seconds uh, view time of your view, depending a little bit on how long is your content. And, and here is a question that I'm kind of curious. How do you actually able to guarantee viewership? Do you do any traffic driving uh, tactics to your website, uh, paid ads? Because, I mean, yeah. that would be the first question the brand would ask. <laughs> of course, of course. And, and, and I would say that is absolutely no secret because whenever we do make an agreement with any brand mm -hmm. and their their content we look at it the way netflix look at a new documentary or a new series that they will launch or that any broadcaster right. will launch any new pro program we look at it we have a nice uh, talk with the brands and the clients about so what do we expect from this piece of content what would be the aim what do you want out of distributing this piece of content mm -hmm. and after that we build a plan uh, on how can we basically execute the best performance and secure that the brands get whatever data and engagement that they are really aiming to get from this piece of content. Mm -hmm. So like we, just, we just play the marketing uh, just as well as what they would do on yeah, any broadcasters if they were to launch a new program. But in yeah, terms no, of I, your, go ahead, sorry. I yeah. think perhaps the key difference is that we, we look at branded content as content, mm -hmm. as advertising which means we put it center piece. I mean, at center stage on our platform, it's all about the brand piece. And we'll right. treat it as if it was a new piece of a TV show coming out on Friday evening. We can also play with scheduling, so new episodes can come out, you know, next week, watch the next episode. Basically, um, you know, beginning to work with the uh, with formats that, you know, from traditional, uh, mm -hmm. traditional TV is, is working really well. Um, I see. Yeah, and you, and you asked about if we do any traffic driving. Of course we do that. Mm -hmm. Because part of building this marketing plan yep. is to find out where can we convert people to watch the content, which which sources are the most efficient to convert people to really engage with the content. Part of them being external mm -hmm. and part of them being on our internal curation of the platform. And of course, we have a, a I call it a recommendation algorithm mm -hmm. because we mm -hmm. do tend to serve the each user with uh, other pieces of content that rely or that reminds them about the first pieces of content that they entered the platform with. I so see. if they come to Bytes for watching travel documentaries, of course we will make sure that they get served with other pieces of travel documentaries. Right. And is Bytes available on other platform than just the website and the mobile friendly interface well right now no i mean right now we are kind of keeping the content so we are doing a lot of trailer exposure of course but the actual content is viewed on our viewed on our platform and the reason for this is it's the only place where we can actually guarantee this quiet premium experience mm -hmm. yeah because we know on other places this is why we haven't chosen to distribute on all sorts of other channels but 
because on bytes on our own platform, we know we can give that undisturbed experience, which yep. we know and we can, you know, we have the data to support, generates these long views and give people the peace and quiet to sit down and enjoy a 58 minute long documentary. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a major differentiator than all the other main platforms. I call them, you know, the social plazas, <laughs> where yeah. you have the eyeballs there, but you have uh, many interruptions as well. So we have so many exit links that will disturb that UX of yeah. uh, and stealing away your attention from that piece of content that you would basically want to watch. Yeah. I, I would even say on some platforms, you never come to that piece of content that you want to watch because they put in pre-rolls that are almost as long as the piece of content. Yeah, right. and I think we talk a lot about brand suitability at the moment though, and content suitability, I think. I mean, you should uh, choose, uh, and I think there's been a lot of focus on content creation, but we're kind of missing it in content distribution. And I think the whole distribution part around branded content is extremely important to be aware of that going forward. Um, and I think some of the platforms available at the moment are more about video sharing yep. rather than video viewing. Yep. And we're more interested in, in actual video viewing. Mm -hmm. um, so creating right. this connection between brand and users, that's the very important part of, of Bytes. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I keep uh, telling my clients and students is that uh, one of the reasons for the emergence of visual storytelling is because marketers actually look at uh, next door Hollywood and kind of got inspired how they engage audiences for eons, right? So that's really, they wanted to create a long form content that uh, feels like entertainment, not just ads. Because once you feel it's like an ad, you feel like you're being sold to and you automatically push all the you know, barriers up. So, and, and there's also the difference is, as you rightly indicated that there are two types of content, content that you seek that you are willing to spend six hour binging on it, like Netflix or a, in your case on Bytes. But there's content you don't seek that really interrupt what you do, like those pre-roll ads and your attention span there is super narrow <laughs> and short. Yeah. So, so that's really something that uh, I think uh, not a lot of people realize. Uh, one thing I, I'm kind of curious also what you think is I, this is a question that I keep asking all my guests is since it's a fairly a relatively new discipline, how would you define visual storytelling? Well, I think for us, the key word is, uh, is storytelling. And uh, when we went into an into bikes and created the platform, we got some long form pieces that we looked at and we thought to ourselves, Oh no, this is a sort of more like, like a talk show and this is really storytelling or, you know. But over the years, we've, we've come to realize that visual storytelling can be so many things. Yep. And, uh, and, and we've been surprised many times uh, on content that we thought perhaps personally was not the best piece of content, but there was an audience for it. Mm -hmm. We've always found an audience for something a brand had created because the message the brand had at heart when they created that piece of content they tend to always be an audience ready to receive it. So yeah. I think visual storytelling can be so many different things. And I think it's a matter of just uh, experimenting uh, as much as possible. Um, I mean, we could go back to what kind of formats perform best uh, on, on long form, some sort of indicators of that. But basically, I think visual storytelling is all about telling the story you want in the way that you want and then placing it in the right distribution mix. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I would add to that that it is also definitely about like daring to extend the story, to give it the room that it really deserves. So not try to cut it into the 30 or 60 second uh, yeah. frame. So yeah. really open up and give it the place and then find suitable platforms where you can distribute and, and get your audience to engage with it. Um, but I would say, well, that's basically the, the new thing in, in the market at the moment. But I don't think you can create really good visual storytelling in 30 seconds. And, and to draw back, I mean, we had, um, when, when we hired one of our employees, mm -hmm. she said, oh, I'm so in love with this concept. And I really love the fact that you work with long form. She came from, from an, um, an NGO organization. Mm -hmm. And she said, you, you cannot make adult people cry in 30 seconds. You need yeah. to fold up the story. Then they will cry. And then they will donate their money, basically. And yeah. I think that's how you, 
you, you, you seem to communicate maybe not authentic emotions in a 30 second piece of content. But if you really fold out the story and get to know the people behind, this is where the story gets so authentic, but it needs time to be authentic. Right. And that is so important for this uh, discipline. Yeah, and no, I cannot agree more. I mean, uh, definitely we see this uh, time and again that, you know, there's uh, so many drivers that can move uh, people emotionally and you need to give them the sufficient time to really develop the narrative and uh, really get them to know the characters uh, develop this empathy and trust. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the That's things. That... I'm oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to add to that because we we now we, I mean, are founded in Denmark, and of course we have done a lot of this in in Denmark in the Danish market as well. And some of the pieces of content that we saw really perform is actually where the brand was so brave that they do have a hero in the content, mm -hmm. and they do have a bad guy. Basically, yeah. they could authentic uh, persons and and taken out of the real story oh. but to phrase it and to tell the story so you kind of build up a little bit of that they have a mission they have a mm. hero they have a, yeah something that they should should do within a certain time oh, that nice. really yeah that really gives that tense to that piece of content and really keeps people engaged yeah, no, and speaking about the uh, type of content that they uh, actually offering on Bytes, uh, maybe you can share, you know, what uh, visual stories, what uh, types of visual stories uh, Bytes is offering. I know you mentioned documentary series. And also, if you can talk a little bit about uh, what is your uh, selection criteria, how you pick the content. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's important to say that we are expert in distributing long form. We don't create the content. Mm -hmm. um, we're sort of uh, trying to find the right audience uh, and give the content the centerpiece it needs. But in terms of formats, I think one of the things we can see is that people love formats that they can recognize. Yeah. Um, if it's formats uh, that you can recognize either from uh, movies or mm -hmm. from traditional TV, where you have perhaps, uh, as Hilda said, there's a hero, there's a villain, or there's something at stake over eight mm -hmm. episodes where someone has to achieve something, you're following yeah. them. These are all sort of classical narrative mm -hmm. takes on, uh, on on traditional TV formats are really working well for branded content as well. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have a mix of both um, very entertaining pieces that could be both uh, episodic content and then talk shows and series, uh -huh. but also some more, more sort of uh, information based mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, tech talk shows on a weekly basis, what's happening in uh, hosted by a brand. Or documentaries like the Jaguar documentary uh, on, you know, behind the scenes and how they created their electronic car. So I think branded, long-form branded content can be so many things, as long as the narratives uh, follow sort of a, a form that you as a viewer can recognize. Right. And do you have like curation guidelines that uh, you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, we have a lower limit as to the length. Um, we, we're not saying the opposite <laughs> as many other platforms. Uh, we don't want it to be too short. <laughs> yeah. Because some guys are expected to sit down, lean back, and enjoy an experience uh, a long piece of content. So if you give them 30 seconds, they're going to go, what? I just, I just began. Right. Um, so, so there's a length issue. But long form is such a volatile term because for some people it's two minutes and for other people it's an hour. Uh, and again, in our experience, you can just go long because people will stay in your long content. Um, yeah, but I think also to, to, to this point, it's very important to mention that we are not to judge about the story or about the content, but we are definitely to curate and to make sure that users know exactly what they can meet. So I mean, if we do have uh, programs that are in a different, I would say, um, phrase and, and a different way of telling stories, we might put that into the way that we uh, curate the platform. So users knows exactly if I push this button, I do get the, let's say, the strange stories because I know if I push the button. So, so to always be clear to the audience, what happens if you push that button that is signed with documentary, well, you come into the documentary section of the platform. Right, right. This is where you never really tend to uh, disappoint your users. And I would say, on that note, Bytes can basically house all types of different ways of telling a story. Mm -hmm. Because we can always and will always curate it into the right place on the platform. 
Yeah, and I think it's also worth mentioning, we're curating according to users, I mean, or, or topics or themes. So uh, um, if we have a, like a food section on the platform, then the brands behind these food stories can be come from many different industries. Mm. I mean, from a car manufacturer to a right. kitchen manufacturer to a, uh, um, I don't know, a housing company. But they all created a story around topics around food. So they'll sit next to each other and then the content will begin to work for each other. It's yes. one of the things I found once we started this uh, adventure. Um, there's so much excellent branded content hidden on different mm-hmm. platforms that you'd never find. Right. Unless you activate it and, and, and make it work alongside each other. And I mean, the housing company is not in any way in competition with the shoe manufacturer or whoever sure. creates. <laughs> uh, so I, think it's, I think it's also important for brands to kind of, um, you know, let their content play into you know a good uh, curation together with other companies content in a good way yeah good content definitely works for good content that's also yeah. one of the things in in the curation and in in the whole offering to the audience mm-hmm. and they do actually seems to to want more good content when they are at the platform so this is uh, yeah the curation and the recommendation is definitely a big part of how and why we can serve brands in a good way as we can. Excellent. Now, now that we understood uh, more about your business model, the different uh, formats you are serving, maybe we can uh, share a few examples and you can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what, why they are successful uh, example, or maybe talk about uh, some of the success metrics uh, these brands achieved. So, I'll start uh, with the first one you shared with me. Um, okay. So this is a uh, booking.com, right? Um, yeah, booking.com has, uh, has created a, a channel on Bytes where they're uh, basically a content hub where they placed all their long form films. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you can see in the top, they have different series, local guides and sites yep. into different sort of and some of these films can actually easily have been made a couple of years ago, but mm-hmm. they have this evergreen, evergreen quality to them. So they're still relevant for people to watch if you're traveling to Barcelona or wherever you're going. Um, right. This is mm-hmm. another dimension of advice. We would like to create content hubs, long form film content hubs um, for brands, you know, where you can direct your users to. And again, without there being a lot of exit links or noise to the content, but build that kind of content hub, that content channel um, that that looks has this premium look and feel and respects the, and respect the users. Um, and I think one of the things we have found is that when we create content hub like this on an, a third party platform and on an external platform rather than on your website, it has mm-hmm. some sort of credibility um, and it and it takes away sort of the over brandedness. Because sometimes right. I think have uh, content subsites on, on other brands' uh, sales website. We also have sales messages, etc. cetera. Um, and this is what we hear from the users. Sometimes it's, it's just too much. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you definitely also said it yourself. Like, you want to engage with your audience when they have their uh, parades down or the barriers down instead of barriers up. Right. So this is, I mean, if you want to entertain with a piece of branded content, mm-hmm it definitely has a good way into the positive that you do it on a third party platform instead of trying to drag them into your own website right. uh, environment. And there you want to stuff them with that, uh, whatever content that you have, it kinds of getting a little too branded yep. according to the audience that we interviewed. Mm-hmm. So the, I would say it is a more relaxed engagement when you are like distributing that content in, in a third party platform because it is not, and I'm saying this with the, with my fingers here, it is not that dangerous then. Right, no, absolutely. No. And I'm kind of curious also, uh, we talked a lot about long form branded content uh, based on the content you've seen so far, is the product is highly visible in the storylines or is it more uh, minimized? I think uh, it, it varies of course, um, mm-hmm. but there's no doubt that the less, uh, visible it is, the better the content performs. I mean, right. if, you, um, uh, if you take a, a booking door, we have a film from Rental Cars, I don't think you have it right there, but uh, who basically sent three elderly ladies on a road trip. 
Oh, yeah. it was, it's, I mean, the final one in the car, and of course, his rental rights cars are sponsored it, but it's just a brilliant piece of content. And of course, these ladies experience all sorts of things. actually watched it, so it's really entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, but this is a really good piece, and I myself was like, oh, right, yeah. Um, I mean, if you go to the front page, you can probably find, uh, I think, a, uh, a trailer for it. Um, but it's, it's just Here a good example of the ladies of the, yeah. the Grand Tour, not the Granny, but the Grand Tour. Um, and I think all... Oh, Hello, I'm June Glass. I'm Pat. June. June Lomas. I'm 74. I'm 79 years of age. 72. I've got eight grandchildren. I have five grandchildren. I've got two sons and three grandsons. Do you want my address? Yeah. Rental. Was that my mirror? mirror? I think she right? tapped the uh, wing mirror at one stage. I wonder, do you have any crossover? Like this could see, could easily cross over as a TV show, like episodic on the, you know, mainstream TV, right? Do you see instances like that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you could easily work together with different platforms where you can do crossovers. And I, I think there's so much unexplored opportunities in working with long form branded content. Yeah. Um, I think Helen we, we quite agree that we think the future of entertainment is to a large extent going to be branded, not only because it's good business, but also because the brands can be the experts that they are in whatever fields they're, you know, they're working with them. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't know if I told you this, but uh, early in my career, I actually worked uh, in a product placement agency in Hollywood. And I would we would receive, you know, scripts uh, with the, you know, markers of where brands uh, we need to find to, to place there. And in this case, you know, when you think of product placement, anyways, movies are really sponsored by brands. But the difference is that, you know, the script starts with the, you know, a filmmaker or maybe an author and the brands come as an afterthought. What you guys are doing is the crea creativity process starts with the brand. Mm -hmm not with the yeah. outside uh, creator. No, and, and especially, I mean, also as a, as a brand, when you create your movies, I think go back into your own organization and find those quirky, cool experts that you have on whatever topic it is. Um, because actually, uh, they often turn out to be really good storytellers or they can inspire you to create formats and ideas that you perhaps, you know, and it just gets that more feeling than if you get the you know if it's very scripted or someone from the outside who doesn't know right. the organization where the world is doing it. Yeah but it's also something about putting brands and production companies together so kind of um I hope no one will punish me for that but kind of leave out the commercial people to do commercials. Right. So if you really want to play with engagement and you really want to play with storytelling maybe mm -hmm. you should go to that ha I mean to these handcrafters that made video stories for ages and they right. come out of they come out of all types of production companies but to put them together i mean i think the first blog um article we had on vice was with a production company from denmark uh -huh. and he said i do better content if i don't have to deal with the marketing department because they, they don't dare to tell the very good story they are so uh, focused on the ad messages yeah so we thought, oh my God, can we put this on our website? Because this is really I mean, how we are really shaking the market here and right. the CMOs is our clients. And, you know, but, but it, I mean, luckily there are so many brave CMOs out there that mm. are really now willing to go directly to any production company or filmmakers and say, okay, listen, I need to make a story about three grannies going on a tour. I'm basically just supporting them with a car. So yes. whatever they are going to experience, we just find that and, and, and make that story so I get my audience to get a good laugh and a good right. time, 12 minutes with my brand. No, that's basically. awesome. I think it's an amazing uh, concept. It's, it's really unscripted, almost like a reality show, but uh, with a brand behind it. So. And that's so authentic. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just enjoy the yoga scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk about this example, the Abu Dhabi? Yeah, the Abu Dhabi is another example. It's sort of, um, it's, more, it's more serious. Uh, it's still entertainment, but it's, it's more some documentary style. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, it's produced by uh, BBC Storyworks, a beautiful production for Visit Abu Dhabi. Uh -huh. uh, and it's, it's sort of a series where you have three different artists 
telling them, telling you their view on on the city uh, and the place they live, um, and it's it's a it, it's a very sort of you know it, it's an example of you being you know someone's holding your hand through the story and you're seeing it through their lens and with their eyes, and it gives you a different perspective of the uh, of a place than you would have if, if it had just been you know that traditional visit whatever. Yeah, place. Absolutely. And you also get a beautiful travel documentary at the same time because they really show you around mm -hmm. this. Fantastic country. I see. A little bit about the interface. So I'm, I'm probably guessing that uh, as part of the, the success metrics that you're tracking is clicks to the brand website over here, right? Yeah, you, you have only one place where we support the brands with their exit links and that's on their logos. Uh -huh. And they can choose whatever landing page that they want people to seek more information on. Yeah, but basically, I think what we're more about, we're interested in the viewer. The viewership. Watch, yeah. Yeah, the viewership, yeah, the viewership watching as much video content and as long. We'd rather have them watch the entire one hour mm -hmm. film than clicking away too quickly. Um, also, yeah, because we share data with the brand. So afterwards, we can share the data with the brand to, mm -hmm. to have a look and say, okay, here you have, you know, this many people watch this uh, this long uh, this much time on, on the film and they had this these characteristics right and then you can use you can actually use data from long form viewing other places in your marketing funnel got it no this is really yeah. exciting go, go ahead can i just add to this little uh, story because it just it actually has a funny twist the the abu dhabi story here is um it was basically three episodical uh, or uh, three different episodes mm -hmm. uh, used to mainly serve the attention uh, that you get on uh, social media. So it was produced for social media. Oh, I see. Um, but what we have experienced or exper experimented with here on, on uh, Bytes is to cut together the three episodes. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a longer documentary. Right. We've done it a few times, but we definitely always talk to our clients about this if they do have produced content that was a little bit short into the bytes terms um, and what we see is that they lift the average playtime with 300 percent by cutting together the, the three episodes in into elementary yeah so I, I think that that's one of the key messages i think if, if if anything for us today is say don't be afraid to go along there yeah. is an audience for it definitely yeah yeah absolutely no, these are great examples. I really like this uh, type of <laughs> storytelling. Now that you actually uh, have been running uh, Bytes for the past four years, I'm kind of curious uh, also, uh, what would you say was your toughest, toughest challenge and, you know, uh, along the journey and how you did, did you handle it? Well, I think, uh, I think one of the challenges is um, people do what they usually do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're used to using specific platforms and uh, they may not work, you know, that well, but at least no one is, you know, you're doing something. I mean, habit and distribution is, uh, is one of the things that is most difficult to, uh, to get around. And uh, I've spoken to a lot of long form uh, content producers and they say they see, the, they see this, this, the same thing. Basically, if people produce these long form films and then they place it on channels not created for it. So. So we're used to distributing our content and we, are, we feel safe at distributing our content on the platforms that we know. So, yeah, but turning the whole focus in the market from quantity to quality oh, yeah. is really difficult. Because yeah. what you do when you produce a 52, long, a 52 minutes long documentary is that you really want to play with engagement time. Right. And how can you use this engagement time? I mean, what, what will you do with the audience that actually sat down and engaged with your content for 52 minutes. Well, what we talk to our clients about is like, try to segment your data because mm -hmm. we do share data with on, on their own performance. Yep. Um, so, so try to segment your data into the ones that really engaged for a long time and the ones that did not engage for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And after work with them with different messages, right. because that will improve your, I would say, lower funnel activities, that will improve your rate of conversion because mm -hmm. you will keep being relevant to the people based on their behavior and their preference to your brand. I see. And how and, you can and, actually communicate uh, with different segments. I mean, will the brands have uh, their content information? 
as part of what you provide? Well, some of the brands I wish it for specific target groups, but this is one mm. interesting. Yeah. We often, quite often, find that you know we do it. You know, a test the first couple of weeks. Right. You know, it's worth mentioning. Vice is definitely a long tail platform. We like mm -hmm. to work with the content over six to twelve months because, as I said, it has this evergreen quality to it, long form content. But we, within you know a very short time, we can actually see what you know what a viewership is this particular film appealing to. Right. And we have sometimes gone back to brands and say, you think you made the, a documentary uh, for people interested in the brewing beer? Mm -hmm. But you didn't. You actually appeared to make a documentary for people interested in science. Right. So uh, it's a completely sort of shadow target group that you're not aware of who, who's I watching see. your content. Perhaps you should work on your short form and right. your reach. And actually targeting science, science people rather than the brewing yeah, people. Well, and, and at least talk to them in a different way. Yeah, because yeah. they will need messages served in a different way than the brewing people. I see. So it, it's also, and the segmentation of the data mm -hmm. is, I mean, the data that we share with the clients can be segmented based on performance. Mm -hmm. And that is key to the whole uh, idea of why we can support um, the marketing mix and why it makes so good sense to work with top funnel and, uh, and branding activities to improve your lower funnel. But, but to be quite honest, the, the last 10 years, so many brands have been so focused on low funnel. Yeah. yeah. And that you asked about what will be, what is one of the biggest challenges, and it is definitely to drive the awareness into quality yeah. and to make brands aware of how that can really help them into being even more sophisticated and more spot on in their low funnel communication and activities. Yeah, so basically the focus on quality and distribution. That's mm -hmm. actually typical. And we were like, you know, sometimes we're up against other platforms like, but honestly, it's a typical question. What would you rather have, you know, 10,000 10, viewers watching X long time on your engagement, you know, mm -hmm. high engagement, or would you have 100,000 watching two seconds? But right. that all depends on the content. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and also talking to agencies, media agencies, and distribution partners, it's, um, you know, have you actually spoken to your clients about what they're looking for? Is it just reach and vanity metrics, or are they actually looking to engage and connect with the audience? Well, well, for, for this type of content, uh, the typical business objective uh, that you run across is typically top of the funnel, right? Brand awareness, and, <laughs> and then they hope it's going to generate some actual... Uh, lower funnel uh, metrics like you know conversions and stuff s actual sales do they go down to that level or they stay at uh, the brand awareness uh, metrics I mean it, it differs uh, some said the brand uh, awareness but as Hilla said I think the data and the data sharing is key here because mm -hmm. you can take from brand awareness campaigns like long form film and actually use it directly in your lower funnel activity. I see. Um, so, so, I mean, you can take data from long form film and the characteristics of people watching that and actually do more salesy lower funnel campaigns uh, modeled over that target group. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, the, the NGO example is a good example here. I mean, if you choose to watch the full story of whatever uh, very good um, charity NGO project you are probably more likely to donate next time you meet them in the lower funnel. And a lower funnel activity could be in a display or in a retargeting campaign or whatever, how they choose to use that data. But because you choose to engage with the full story, you mm -hmm. one, have a better, um, how do you say, you, you have a better feeling of what do you support. Got it. And you, you kind of, got to feel the emotion of that story, which probably makes it more easy for you to, uh, to, to, yeah, to find the money and to want to support the project. Got it. One thing I'm kind of curious also is, uh, since we're kind of uh, six months in into the pandemic, and mm -hmm. do you see any trends in the content that kind of uh, around, you know, social distancing, remote working, or any other kind of related topic that uh, comes into your mind uh, we actually have a, we're going to release a playlist uh, soon about uh, it's an industry organization who gathers some of the best examples from different countries in the world on, on covid uh yeah. on covid content um yeah. both some very funny examples and some some more serious examples mm -hmm. uh, we'll share that but i think i think there's been 
I think one of the funny things is that all people producing content were kind of at the same level all of a sudden. People producing TV content was also sort of back to a very basic level in there. Right. Um, it, it's, I think we're seeing some very innovative solutions. I mean, one of the things, um, I just had a, uh, today a talk with a client who were, you know, doing a, a bit like we we're doing a Zoom, Zoom interview. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I said to them, if, if you're able to meet and you can sit apart or, or, or if you're able to create a studio where you can actually pretend to be a host in the studio and then have the guests all right sitting next to you on a big screen, right. it, it works better than just having, you know, two Zoom people talking to each other. Sure. I had a funny example of, of someone doing that where they had a big TV screen on the couch. You had the sort of the, you know, <laughs> setting and you had the host, which was beautiful on that. Right. And they people on the screen. But it yeah. just worked better. No, uh, totally. So, I mean, trying to stick to some of the some of the formats or that we know works, I think right. is quite cool. But on that note, I think what we're hearing from brands is that actually more people are going to long-form content <laughs> and, uh, mm-hmm. and producing on the go. Because you don't know where the world is in two months' time. True. I don't know if you've seen, uh, the, I did a talk about uh, visual storytelling in the times of Corona and actually used the example of Audi Austra- Australia that did this uh, three-hour <laughs> video where they show, you know, it's really a scenic ra- a ride using an Audi car, of course, but it's, it's kind of really supposed, it was really released a, a, about mid-April when everybody was under a severe lockdown. So this scenic ride with the product was supposed to kind of relax people and there was no dialogue, no nothing. You just watch this in the background. <laughs> and you pretended to be out of home. There was actually, I don't know if you know this, but there's a moment in Norway who was created on the train ride mm-hmm. where they put a camera in front of the train and then for six hours the train just rode. Yeah. Nothing happened. Just looking out the front of the train. Yeah, you're just looking there. You know it, it became iconic in Scandinavia. So everyone put, you know, yeah. six hours. Yeah, <laughs> well, but I think I mean on on yeah being in the pandemic had done a lot of things to the market and it kind of uh, equals all of us large companies with small companies and you know really good advertisers with not that big advertisers but what the trend that I really feel is is growing now mm-hmm. is this um, don't be so pushy in your selling. Because right. it's not good, it's not good style in yeah. in a market crisis, so that kind of forces brands to think different. Yeah. Of course, they want to sell their products, but they don't want to be that pushy brand mm-hmm. going out there and doing exactly what they did one year ago. So exactly. it's kind of like all brands seems to find a new style mm-hmm. and tell these good stories and convincing their audience about why are they. Uh, why do they deserve to get uh, to to be bought? Basically, right. that is a better way. In 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 societies in crisis, I would say it changes the tones that we communicate and sell our products with. And storytelling is uh, definitely a trend. Yeah, absolutely. So, if you, we need to to summarize, you know, all the great information you shared so far, if you need to kind of summarize, uh, what would be your th- top three tips? for you know, brand marketers or marketers that are listening or watching this uh, show, how they can create compelling long-form branded content. What would you say? Well, I would well, say be brave. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I said at some point, um, there is always an audience for whatever your idea is. I mean, at least yep. we found that um, there will be people interested in what you're trying to tell. So, so yep. sort of stay, stay uh, you know, true to that and stay true to your story basically and don't be afraid to open up and sort of be honest about the company and the place where you work i think that that's one very important so, so basically be brave because the market is much more appreciative and open to long form now and to branded content and i think there were uh, six months ago mm-hmm. yeah and i would say play with length i mean exceed all uh, all length that you have done before because now you really have platforms where that can take care of your long form stories and you do have an audience who really wants to engage with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so don't stick to the 30 and 60 second formats. I would go longer than that. I would go 10 minutes and above. I would go into serious. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would go into scheduling to keep mm-hmm. that audience coming back. So right. maybe really your content in different ways. Yeah. Um, and I would, I mean, 
being authentic and open up the, the doors to your company is one way of telling a story. But go to the filmmakers and ask them, how do you see I can tell the best story? Yeah. Because they do have crazy good ideas on how you can make yourself relevant to your target group and how you can basically get your target groups and your audience to stay tuned and really create brand love, if I may use that word, because that's, that's basically what it's all about. Like you want the audience to love your brand and you yeah. know if they love your brand, they will stick to buy your brand right. in the low funnel activity. Yeah, I really I like what you said. I think it's, it's super important because not a lot of people uh, realize that, that in order to create a really powerful uh, brand content, you need to work with fil filmmakers, cinema cinematographers, really people that knows how to create movies, you know, for art purposes, but- And don't actually... run away when they ask you to create a hero, because it's, I mean, yeah. in, into something, but it's really a good thing that you yeah. use the grips, if, can I call it the grips, that you, you see from Hollywood productions. Exactly. So one of these uh, way of producing. No, absolutely. All right. So before we go, I want to, where do you see the future is going for long form branded content? Any guesses and uh, projections? <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think uh, this pandemic uh, has actually uh, um, sort of uh, speeded up the, the evolution for branded content. I think we're going to see a lot more long form and more cinematic branded content now. Mm -hmm. because people are more willing to experiment um so we're quite excited about the year to come and, and this uh yeah is also to see where you know what, what kind of formats are coming out and how are people playing with new ideas um but i think in the long run we're very we agree that a lot of the good entertainment shows they're going to be produced by brands from now on yeah no i definitely can I see that see much more documentaries like the one we see from the from jaguar that mm -hmm. you can also uh, access on the US platform that is I would say that is a brilliant piece and very very uh, brave piece of content 57 minutes uh, of course it has admissions and it, it was produced for a reason as well uh, but I definitely do hope and I do see the trends that much more brand will produce either long-form documentaries or serials or mm. entertainment and I think they will this is a loop because I think they will repeat it once they see the effect and once they see how much, um, I would say, brand ambassadorship they can create on this. And another trend that I see is that more and more brands are now hiring uh, heads of uh, entertainment. Studios, so they, yeah. do actually, they do actually start to hire people within their marketing organization right. that has this one focus to be head of branded entertainment. Yeah, that's, that's so awesome. that, and, and I hope that means that they will produce much more branded entertainment. Yeah, and finally, I think what we are hoping for is that uh, both agencies and brands become more critical of, of the distribution, of course, and begin now having demands for quality and not just quantity. Uh, and begin working with, you know, from the onset that you begin creating a piece of content, you already then begin thinking distribution. Um, yeah. But I, I would think, say... Yeah, go ahead. Quality, quality distribution will definitely follow to quality conversions. And if we can just keep that in mind, I think the market will adapt itself away from only reach, reach, reach. Like I just want to hit as many people as possible right. and I don't care how they engage with my piece of content. Of course you should have reach <laughs> to your campaign. I completely uh, know that, but you can build reach in many ways. I just say part of your campaigns should definitely be based on how can I, sorry, how can I maximize uh, the quality of that reach building on, of my uh, following conversions. No, absolutely. I couldn't say it's better. You know, it's, it's really, you got to lead with quality first and then all the rest will follow. So how can audiences, our audience uh, can they contact you if they have any questions? Yes, of course. They can reach out to uh, to Helen and I, uh, and they have contact details on the platform as well. And perhaps you can share our contact details when we share this podcast. Um, yeah. Yeah. But also, I mean, advice is free to watch. It's this unique, unique thing. Oh, it's yeah. free to watch. There's no advertising because you know. Yeah, it's, that's it's against the motto. <laughs> so I mean, we'd love for people to just go in and browse around and look at the different sites and get some inspiration. Also, because there are quite a lot of pieces to 
Um, of course, being born out of Denmark, we have the most pieces of content in Denmark. You wouldn't mm. understand a word of it, but you can still perhaps get a sense of, you know, right. ideas, content forms, sure. shapes, and so but mm. Yeah, so go and browse around and uh, reach out if you, if you yeah. have any questions. We have all contact information on the platform as well, under About Bytes. So just reach out either on our contact email or directly to Nina and I. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I want to thank you so much uh, for the great uh, information you shared today. I mean, this is uh, such an exciting journey. I mean, I've been thinking about, you know, this direction uh, four years ago myself. You know, we actually started at the same point. So it's great to see another uh, initiative that's uh, really getting a lot of traction and being successful. And I really wish you the best day uh, of success uh, in, the, in the road ahead. Well Thanks a lot for letting us join us. It was such a pleasure. Yeah, it was really a pleasure. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. And for those of you watching and uh, listening, I uh, hope to see you all in our next episode of the Visual Storytelling Today podcast. See you next time. Visual Storytelling Today is recorded in Miami, Florida. The show is published exclusively by Visual Storytelling Institute. Learn more at visualstorytell.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on the iTunes Store. Until next time, don't let your big story wait to be told.